This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. If you look at basically the last 30 years or so of society, the only thing that really mattered to doing was going long technology. Like this is where the next Citadel, the next Jump Trading, the next Jane Street is going to be born is in this time. All right, guys, today we have a real treat on Empire. I am here with two folks who need no introduction. Kyle Samani and Tushar Jain, founders of Multicoin, what many believe to be the top performing crypto fund of all time. Their portfolio includes uh, a couple of names you guys might recognize. Solana, of course, Arweave, Audius, Helium, uh, Near. I think you guys did as well. Tagomi, The Graph. Um, man, I feel like I could go on and on. Uh, many more top tier, uh, tier one crypto brands. Kyle, Tushar, welcome to Empire, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us on, Jason. Yeah, good to be of course. here. Of course. Uh, on your website, it says, crypto will create the largest one-time shift in wealth in the history of the internet. There are a couple different things coming together. Uh, Tushar, you gave this opening keynote at the Multicoin Summit, talking about the open finance renaissance with stable coins and yield farming and composability and DeFi. You also talked about the Web3 vision with NFTs and the metaverse. So as we enter 2022, I want to get an update on the thesis. What is your guys' general thesis for crypto right now? Hard to simplify it down to just one thesis. I think crypto is breaking into sectors now and you have, uh, you know, DeFi is different than NFTs, is different than decentralized wireless networks or uh, social tokens. And so I, I think the broad crypto thesis is just credible neutrality and more efficient internet native coordination. Uh, but now we have moved beyond that to sub pieces as an industry, I think. I think the best comp in history right now in terms of time of where we are is like 2009 for mobile. Um, where like the people who were like paying attention and like following tech can like very clearly see like this is going to change the world. Um, and that's kind of true. Obviously, we're recording this podcast, so we all probably believe that mostly. Uh, the world at large still is, is not quite getting it. Uh, but there's also still a lot of open questions about who's going to win. Um, you know, the Apple versus Google, uh, rivalry in like 09 to 2012 was like pretty epic. And like in their keynotes, you know, they were like taking shots at each other and like all the tech press was kind of framed in the Apple versus Google, you know, lens. Um, and there was Windows Mobile, there was BlackBerry, there was Symbian, there was Palm OS. People kind of forget all that other stuff happened, like all in that two to three year period. Um, but all those, all those things happened and obviously two, two were left relevant. Um, I kind of think we're at a similar point in time now where like the people who are paying attention can see this is going to change the world. Um, and But like it's still unclear which platforms are really going to be the dominant platforms. Um, and there's kind of just like an absolute insanity mad rush of like everyone trying to, to make sure they are relevant in, in five years. Yeah. Um, probably you end up with two, maybe three that matter. Uh, I, I think it's unlikely that more than three of the, uh, I'll call them DeFi execution engines uh, matter in five years. Yeah. And by DeFi, so, okay. So you mentioned Apple, Google. So let's, let's start getting into these. Like De I'm assuming by DeFi execution engines, you're talking about the L1s? Uh, it could be Ethereum L1, it could be Solana, correct? I, I use that term to distinguish uh, other types of L1. So like notably things like Ceramic or things like Arweave um, in particular, those are like functionally very different, uh, but they are like technically L1s. Okay. So I, I think the world as we know it right now, like you kind of have these, uh, oftentimes you have several different companies that are competing each, against each other and two kind of come out, right? So if you talk about mobile phones, like remember like the M Motorola StarTac and like the Nokia 9000 and the Palm Pilot and like the RIM BlackBerry. And really what happened is you got two operating systems. You got the Apple operating system and the Android operating system, kind of similar in cloud, right? You have dozens of cloud players, but really it kind of converged on like Amazon AWS and Google Cloud. And then I guess Microsoft Azure as well. Um, I guess Alibaba has their own cloud service as well, but there's really three or four cloud services. So let's start talking about L L1s. So you guys have made this, uh, I mean, pretty big thesis on on L1s, saying that 
you guys were very early calling out a Solana, but B calling out just the issues with Ethereum. And it turns out that you guys were right about that. Right. And you guys made some very contrarian bets that went against this like crypto OG thesis that L1s would decentralize uh, and, and L2s that you needed L1s to be decentralized and L2s would scale. So when you think about kind of the future of L1s going into 2022, is it a, are we looking at like a multi-chain future? Are we looking at Solana is I mean, I know you guys are very into Solana. So like Solana wins everything. Is it a multi-chain future or what does this look like to you guys? You know, over the next 12 months, it appears the world is going to get more heterogeneous. Um, Avalanche has a real because it's like something is happening there. Stuff is happening in Luna. Stuff is happening in Polygon. Um, we'll see if stuff happens in Polkadot. I mean, it, it you know maybe it gets off the ground. It's obviously a little bit late, but you know who knows. Um, we'll see if people rebuild everything on Starknet and it all works. You know, like th those things are, are are still TBD. But it's pretty obvious all of those ecosystems have uh, meaningful momentum and will continue to, to generally compound in a positive direction. Um, I think the big question in my mind is, uh, unlike previous major technology platforms, the, the two most recent notable ones being the PC and then mobile, in both of those cases, you had to physically roll out a bunch of hardware to a bunch of people, and that obviously takes time. And also people are, uh, you, know, you don't carry two phones in your pocket, like for the most part, and most people only have one computer. Um, in crypto, neither of those things is true. All the hardware is already there. Uh, app developers, users don't actually pick blockchains. App developers pick blockchains. Um, and so those competitive dynamics are a little bit different. Uh, given the fact that the hardware is already physically in place, um, my sense is that the rate of like usage, there's going to be a, a, a month or two, which is the vertical line. And like the most obvious example of that that you can kind of sort of see if you squint is Instagram NFTs. Um, Adam Mosieri, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but he publicly said like a week or two ago, we're going to launch NFTs. <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's going to be the moment that we all look back and we're like, oh, like that was the thing. Um, and that's going to kind of reshape the entire perception of, of the market. Uh, I have no idea what Instagram is going to do. I don't know if they're going to, launch on their own permission chain or if they're going to launch on Solana or on Starkware. I, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, maybe they're going to launch on multiple, but you know, I, I think people underappreciate the mag, how large of an effect that's going to have on perception. Because once that happens, the interest and desire for everyone else to congregate around that, that same execution layer uh, will increase pretty substantially. Today, you look at all of the ecosystems and all of them to get off the ground basically had to be a casino in some form or fashion, whether it was Ethereum or Solana or Avalanche or whatever. And that's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with, with being a casino to start, but you can't be a casino forever. Um, and uh, I, I think the existing American technology giants are going to seriously impact uh, that, how that shapes out. Now, look, if Stripe picks chain A and Facebook chick picks chain B and Twitter picks chain C and whatever, like it's totally possible they all pick different chains and you end up in, in some sort of like five-way heterogeneous outcome. Like, you know, that, that can totally happen. My guess is that that's not going to happen. I, I just think it's going to make everyone's lives miserable for that to happen. Um, I don't think bridging will ever become magic. Uh, bridging will get better, but un unless bridging is magic, I think there's strong, uh, strong returns to kind of everyone agreeing on the same set of standards. And so uh, that's my general sense of how I think the next, like these ecosystems will continue to exist. They will grow. But uh, once the American technology giants roll out, whatever it is that they roll out, uh, it's going to completely change where everyone else wants to build. I'm just really curious to hear how you guys think the, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Instagrams of the world uh, will tie into this like, web three world like do they end up just becoming uh almost the it kind of feels like the big decision that these tech companies have to make is do they or do they not become interoperable with crypto and basically half of them or i don't know how many but like some of them will continue creating their walled gardens and some of them will become interoperable with crypto and the ones that do become interoperable with crypto will end up almost being the go-to front ends for crypto right like if facebook ends up integrating with i don't know Solana or ETH or whatever it is, like they they will become the front end for the metaverse as we know it. It feels very 
Uh, but if they don't integrate with crypto, I feel like folks will move elsewhere. Uh, Tushar, Kyle, agree, disagree? Where do, where do you guys see the role of these big social media platforms you know, over the next 10 years here? I think they will matter. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's the only thing that matters. I, I think there's a lot of bottoms up innovation that will also definitely matter. A lot of crypto native innovation. Uh, but at the same time, I think the environment that the tech giants are in now is a really unique moment in time. They are aware of the risk of disruption. Like they saw what happened to IBM, you know, decades ago. Um, they saw what happened really to Microsoft before this recent reinvention uh, as Microsoft missed the entire move to mobile. Um, and like Google still feels the pain of missing social, right? So they understand uh, that the new paradigm can come around and they are not immune from it and the market will grow dramatically. And if they don't seize that opportunity, they're just ceding that to someone else. And so I think that the culture in these big tech companies is very cognizant of that. And they um, have learned the lessons of the past in this case. Um, however, at the same time, like I think that there is a lot of bottoms up crypto innovation, like things that those big tech companies are just not going to be able to do, uh, at least not in the same way that crypto can do them, right? Like uh, issuance of new tokens, um, really hard for a large institution to do, but like an anon dev team can do that. You know, like a rebasing stablecoin or, you know, other interesting, like off the beaten path, outside in type innovations, uh, I, I think you will see uh, happen in a crypto native way. Um, and then the other thing I think is really interesting to answer is how will the big American tech giants choose chains to build on? Right? Because they're all thinking about it. Obviously, Facebook has talked about it publicly, but it would be crazy to assume that the other companies have not had serious conversations about what they could do or what they should do. Um, and I think the thing that they care about the most is stability on the platform layer. They want to know that they can build and that things can compound and that the rules are not going to change underneath them. Right? Uh, Kyle wrote a really good blog post about this earlier this year uh, and talked about just like unsure roadmaps of things like Ethereum and Ethereum L2s and like, oh, to scale, first, actually, we're gonna scale on L1. No, 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 we're gonna go to uh, rollups. No, um, actually, it's gonna be zero knowledge proofs and zero knowledge rollups now, instead of optimistic rollups. And like, it just keeps changing. And that makes it very, very difficult for large organizations and, and large businesses to commit to build there versus knowing that the platform is stable. Well, I'm, I'm curious, like, how you guys think about like um, Ethereum. Um, Obviously, you guys have been very vocal about it, but um, we have the merge potentially coming in Q2. Um, in your portfolio, I mean, obviously you have exposure, or you've had exposure to Ethereum or Ethereum-based projects. Um, how do you think about, a lot of times it's difficult. Oh, I remember, you know, the people look at you and say, wait a minute, you, you have all these different bets and you get criticism for that. Um, I am curious how you guys manage kind of the, your investing approach. Um, you know, obviously I think, we're all kind of saying the same thing, which is we're very early. We, we don't have standards. Um, how do you manage a portfolio? And, and how do you think about like placing different bets in, in a very specific category where it, it potentially could be, you know, conflicting or, you know, competitive? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit. So um, the more general purpose the thing is, the more... I think we are okay being in competitors and it turns out the entrepreneurs also tend to feel approximately the same way. Um, right? Like none of the L1 teams seem to care that most of the major VCs are in a lot of them. Um, as you move up the stack and it's like, Hey, we both have uh, a messaging app for disappearing messages. Like you start and then like, in like you have to, you have to, in that context, you have a lot of proprietary thinking on um, growth loops and user engagement numbers, uh, you know, and other things that might not, not might not necessarily be on chain. And so, the more of the the work that you do that is either proprietary or just not on chain, the more naturally sensitive um, you know builders are, and the more sensitive builders are to that, then the more sensitive we we need to be as well. Um, we've been fortunate that for most of the last four years kind of sort of something approaching 100% of the output of almost all of the teams is completely open. 
Um, this is obviously true with the layer ones themselves, uh, and it is almost entirely true for DeFi as well. As you get into more and more consumer-facing things uh, and, and consumer-facing apps where not necessarily 100% of the application lives on chain, um, that will become less true, and therefore people will become more sensitive. Uh, but it's like hard to say you have like a lot to hide if you know 100% of your app lives on chain. Like, what are you what are you hiding from, from anybody, right? Yeah. Um, so I th that's how we generally think about just just conflicts uh, between founders and such. The other part of it, obviously, is just helping people, um, and like we always make sure to be there for our portfolio companies. Uh, my general rule of thumb is if you call me at Friday at 9 p.m., I have to answer the phone. And if I'm not willing to answer the phone Friday at 9 p.m., then we shouldn't do the deal. Uh, and whether that's me or Tushar or someone else in the right. firm, it's not yeah. everything has to roll up to me. But uh, someone at the firm has to answer the phone Friday at 9 p.m. Get a lot of uh, dinner disruptions there, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not fun, but this is the cost of playing the game. One thing that comes to mind is you're, it's actually almost like a pivot for the firm. Um, and what I mean, or maybe it's not a full pivot. Maybe that's the wrong way to describe it. But like when I think about multi-coin investing and like when I think about have had conversations with you guys over the years, like you guys very deeply understand the tech and you do a lot of like what I'd call deep crypto tech investing. And the shift that's happening is what it feels like you're describing is a lot of the tech issues have almost gotten solved already, except maybe some bridging things like bridging tech needs to be improved. ZK stuff needs to get improved. And that's just kind of like tough mathematical things that need to get solved. But really we're the last 10 years, we're like investing the venture side of crypto is investing in the tech. We're now moving into an era where we're investing in the consumer side of stuff. Like you're, mess you're talking about disappearing messaging apps and not being able to invest in two things. Like that's investing in Snapchat versus investing in protocols. And that's very different style of investing. So how do you guys, keep that advantage and like am i am i on the right mark here that like the investing is changing maybe um i think you're right about some things the way that i would explain it isn't that the problems are solved because like the tech is not all built yet it's more like the design spaces have been fully explored um so like the design space for scaling an l1 seems to have been fully explored at this point Right, like we've seen people try all the different approaches. Now all of them are going to continue working on optimizations, and obviously not everything has shipped. But the major teams have carved out. You know, what are the main design decisions that they've made? What are the trade-offs that they have chosen? And investors are able to go and choose which trade-offs they like. Um, right, and think about, oh yes, I I may have to trade off scaling in a single shard for higher cost to run a validator and inability to like run one off, uh, you know, a $200 laptop or whatever. Um, or I might have to sacrifice composability in order to get sharding and the ability to scale, you know, horizontally in that way. Right? And these are trade-offs. Like not, one is not like clearly the right answer compared to the other. Uh, but I think that once the design space is explored, then it feels like it's been solved in, in a sense, but like there's still a lot of engineering work to do to actually ship all of those and get them to the ultimate form of what they are. Um, now, as that happens, investing moves higher up the stack, right? And as investing moves higher up the stack, you're getting closer to the consumer. That doesn't necessarily mean that the investing like style needs to change because it like at the core of what we do it, from a, a style perspective, it's like, first, we start with a thesis, second, we try to explore the design space of how you could build this product. Um, and what, and then we try to make pointed bets where we can build strong conviction. And that can work higher up the stack as well as it works lower in the stack. Um, and a lot of the higher up the stack is still really technical investing, right? If you are trying to invest in a DeFi derivatives protocol, yes, it's not an L1, but th that's not like, you know, I'm investing in which user experience, like on, on an app, like that's the only differentiation. No, there's like a risk engine you have to underwrite. How does the collateral system work? You know, what are these different order types that it can support, et cetera. So it, it is still deeply technical. I want to, now that you touch on um, you know, DeFi, what are your thoughts on DeFi? And, and perhaps as a broader question, like things that may have struggle to get ground in terms of users and adoption in Ethereum that may work in a different environment like Solana. So I'm curious, like, are you, are you excited about DeFi? And if you are or not, would like to explore that. And, um, and what are some of the things that may work better in an environment like Solana relative to Ethereum? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're still super bullish DeFi and we've made 
this calendar year, probably at least 10 new DeFi investments. Most of them were on Solana, maybe even up to 20, but somewhere between 10 and 20. Um, so yeah, super bullish DeFi. Um, I think there is a legit question to ask of why did Ethereum DeFi assets underperform everything in the market this year, basically. Um, and there's probably a few reasons. The most obvious one, and I, th I think the most important is just gas and people got sick of it. And they also started using the other chains and they said, this is a better experience. And then they just got really bearish on Ethereum DeFi and they sort of just moved elsewhere. Um, that That's the simplest explanation. And it's not the only one, but it's definitely the simplest and probably explains, I'd say at least 60%, maybe upwards of 80% of, of the apathy. Um, you can find others, people talk about regulatory concerns and, and uh, we have kind of a theory on, on efficiency and, and yield and um, MEV and some other ideas as well, but that's probably the bulk, the bulk of it. Um, but yeah, we're super bullish DeFi. We continue to invest uh, in it. Um, in terms of things that are you know uniquely enabled by Solana, certainly the most important one is, is Serum, um, which is just you know first order, a uh, better mechanism for price discovery and liquidity provisioning. Um, I do think actually one of the most interesting innovations in 2021 in DeFi was Uniswap V3. Um, the idea specifically of range orders, I find interesting that, that you can, you can use a fixed amount of gas and simulate what is, you know, a hundred or even a thousand on-chain limit orders is like a fundamentally useful thing. Uh, I think the Solana community has, has undervalued the importance of that. Um, you obviously lose a little bit of precision as a liquidity provider in doing so, but that's okay. You can accommodate for that in spreads. Um, like that, that's not a huge problem. Um, DeFi will always have wider spreads than CeFi um, because of just the mechanics of the nature of the market and how price discovery works and how you cross the spread and all those things. Um, and so I think it's okay. You just want it to be as tight as possible, right? right? Um, but, but I think Serum is obviously the most important thing. I think range orders are combined with the Serum style order book are obviously quite compelling. Um, and then I think we're starting to just now see uh, the next kind of wave of things that are, are starting to be things that really only work on Solana and, and struggle on ETH, the most notable of which is options. Uh, Zeta and Psy, I believe, are probably the two most well-known options teams on Solana, and they're building just a straight-up on-chain order book. Um, now those teams are also talking about uh, natively interoperating with Mango, with uh, Zero One, uh, with Drift, and some of the other futures and perpetuals teams. And once you have futures and options, you know, cross collateralizing. Now you have an experience that can rival there a bit uh, until then you just can't. And that means the leverage is not there for the, for the market makers and the capital efficiency is posed. So, uh, I I'm I, at this point, I don't even think it's a question like option DeFi options will take off first on Solana. I don't even really see a path for it to happen on Ethereum. Um, and you can already see the, the inklings of it on, on Solana right now. Um, and then the kind of the ultimate step of all of the above, um, is uh, really building a DeFi native prime brokerage. So in my uh, presentation at the Multicoin Summit a few weeks ago, I highlighted this specifically, where you know as you have more and more liquidity venues, you've got more and more derivatives exchanges, more and more types of derivative contracts, you want them to all natively compose with each other. Um, and there are now at least two teams on Solana working on this. There's Margin Fine and another, I think, maybe even one more. Um, and I think it's gonna be very exciting as, as people start to appreciate the power that a random retail person will get access to the same degree of sophistication in, in prime services for, for cross margining across a range of venues as JP Morgan provides to Citadel or Morgan Stanley or, you know, whatever to any hedge fund. Um, and like that democratization of access to margining and, and prime services is like going to be really cool. Um, the closest thing retail has to this day is probably interactive brokers, um, which is, which is clunky and, and has its own set of problems. Um, and I'm pretty excited to see that that happen. Uh, Tushar, I don't know if you want to add anything to that on, on DeFi. Um, I have some alternative theories here. I, I, I mean, I agree with Kyle that like one of the main reasons that Ethereum DeFi underperformed is people who use it just got sick of paying the fees and then tried other things. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's an important mechanical reason. Uh, but in addition to that, I think we saw a change in the user composition of DeFi. So, when DeFi summer really took off in 2020, like no professionals were really set up to be in DeFi. So it was a bunch of retail, it was a bunch of DGENs, it was a bunch of crypto native people who were in DeFi. Then people saw, oh my God, look at these yields and I can get this on stable coins. 
that's amazing. Or I can go and borrow this asset and, and get this yield. Or, you know, if you're getting yields 50, 60, 70, 80%, that's extraordinarily attractive to a class of professional market makers and liquidity providers who have access to capital in the, you know, low single digits, mid single digits range. And so they came in and they ran the ARB in massive, massive size. And we're talking about billions of dollars of size. And as they come in, the retail holders, the crypto natives, they were holding the governance tokens that they farmed. The pros don't hold those tokens. They sell those tokens. They are seeking yield. They are professionals. They are not speculating. They are here for yield specifically. And that just mechanically changes the equation, right? Like uh, yield farming was always very reflexive. It was reflexive up in that as you get more activity in the protocol, trading volume or TVL, you know, whatever your KPI is, uh, then that generates more fees. People are willing to pay more for the token. And then liquidity mining rewards are more lucrative. And so, you know, that positive flywheel spins. But then as soon as the pros started showing up and selling the tokens and the price of the uh, of these things start to go down, well, that reflexivity starts to break. And I think that that has been a major cause of the DeFi performance was an over-reliance on liquidity mining. It was just, it, you know, everyone just kept looking at, oh man, I just turn on liquidity mining and the numbers keep going up. This is amazing. And, you know, I felt like Chicken Little shouting like, oh no, the sky is falling. Like, this is not sustainable. You can't have APIs as high. I remember looking at like, um, I looked at Compound, for example, and like so much of the TDL is just like you borrow from one pool and lend back on the other side in order to lever yourself up in order to maximize liquidity mining rewards. And it's like, well, clearly this is not the future. Like, you know, this can be useful as a bootstrapping mechanism, but you have to like bridge to somewhere. You can't just like say, well, this is going to be it. Um, and I, I think that that has been a major, major thing. I think the second thing that happened this year that really drove down DeFi valuations is people realize that the most effective value capture for DeFi activity is not DeFi governance tokens or the fees that they collect. It is MEV. Um, and MEV will actually be the dominant value capture out of DeFi. And that's why I think L1s also outperform dramatically because in a proof of stake system, you can value your L1 token as the discounted cash flow value of future MEV on that chain. Um, and uh, we published a post recently uh, called DAOs Don't Collect Fees, DAOs Manage Risk. And this was um, talking specifically about DeFi protocols that put up a random gate where they're like, oh yeah, you know, uh, five bits of all trading volume goes to these governance token holders. And like that is not a sustainable model in our opinion, because those governance token holders like should just get forked out. They're not governing anything and they have no right to collect fees in an economically efficient system. Right. This is why I think Uniswap, to their credit, has not added governance token fees. And I don't think that they can really in, in like the same form uh, because like they realize that just gets forked out. Like that, that's not a sustainable long term model. But really, the value capture here comes out of MEV. Right. So if you are staking a bunch of ETH post the merge and you are the validator who's called up, you will choose your arbitrage transaction to go into that block rather than someone else's. And so you will get to extract all the MEV profits from that trading activity on Uniswap. Or, you know, if you are on Solana and there's a bunch of trading activity on Serum, like you will get to choose as a, as a validator who's leader of consensus at that moment uh, to, that your arbitrage transaction goes in. And that's how you extract value out of DeFi. And so, L, like, this is just fat protocol thesis, like all over again, proof of stake version. Tushar, before Santiago, I know you have a question, but before jumping into that, can you just give a quick breakdown of MEV and just like what is minor extractable value and like what is this basic form of, I think the basic form of MEV is just arbitrage. Uh, and so like, can you just give a high level on what MEV is for folks who don't know? Yeah, the easiest way to understand MEV is it's basically whatever high frequency traders were doing in TradFi in DeFi, right? So high frequency traders arbitrage prices between different exchanges or different venues, uh, right? Like oil trades on many different exchanges and it might be at different prices. And so, you know, they want to bring that in line or they're bringing things in line between futures and spot. Um, also, they're doing things like, uh, you know, putting in an order based on where they think flow is going, right? And, and they're running a lot of really complicated um, math to understand, you know, where some of the flow is going. If we see, you know, someone selling a bunch of this commodity like, should I sell this other commodity over here before the price reacts? And they're keeping all these prices in line. And that is an extraordinarily profitable activity. 
keeping market prices in line is, is very, very lucrative. And MEV is doing all of those activities on chain. Uh, but the specific thing that's different about MEV than traditional finance is in traditional finance, it's just about who is fastest, right? And you have co-location with the servers, et cetera. In crypto, it's all about who has the most stake. Because if you are leader of consensus for a block, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, you get to choose which transactions are going to go into that block. And you get to choose which order those transactions go into that block. So if there was an arbitrage transaction or there was any other type of HFT, high frequency trading type transaction, you choose your own. And we know that those are very massively EV positive things to do. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier. It makes it faster. It makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH. Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago. Pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in. Let's say I want to swap you know, 0.2 ETH. For USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. And are there, Tushar, are there funds doing this? Like, are there large funds that are just like almost MEV arbitrage funds? Yes, several. Lots and they are doing this at massive scale. Yeah. Um, and they have earned like earth-shattering returns, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. Like, I, I think Ethereum had over a billion dollars of MEV this year, and that is a lower bound. You know, it could have been substantially higher than that. If you count all the NFT mints and stuff, like, you get to choose. I'm going to be the, the one who gets to mint all the NFTs because I'm leader of consensus for this block. Uh, you add that up with all of the DeFi activity, and it is massive. And people are doing this professionally. Uh, and, and so I think it's a golden era. Like, if you want to get involved, like this is where the next Citadel, the next Jump Trading, the next Jane Street is going to be born is in this time. So if you're looking to start, you know, a quant trading operation or an HFT operation, like now is the time to do that. Otherwise, for more passive investors who don't have the level of, uh, you know, sophistication to go and run MEV strategies themselves, I think owning L1 tokens is probably the easiest, best uh, way to get exposure to it. Because in an efficient market, you have to assume that that equilibrium will happen between the cost to run these MV strategies in terms of staking and the return from them. And all these yields all start to converge uh, over time. So the yields from MEV will start to converge with the cost of capital that exists in the broader world. I fully expect to see a world in several years time where there are businesses where their entire business model is we face a lot of consumers, we charge no fees, we subsidize all gas costs, we have a staking, we either, whether we use Lido or, or someone else, or whether we fork their stuff and use it on our own, we take staking derivatives, we run it ourselves, and we generate all of our profits from MEV, and we have enough stake that we have enough chance to make enough money on the MEV to run a, 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 a business, like a, a venture scale business. I expect there will be many venture scale businesses in 10 years that that is effectively their entire business. If I'm an outsider looking in and almost like listening to this conversation and looking into crypto over the last several years, it's a big money casino, right? You've got like DeFi and you've got these crazy APYs and you've got like uh, tokenizing MEV and like, you know, I, I do, this is not how I feel, but I do understand how kind of crypto outsiders can see the space as a big casino. I really do. I empathize with it and I get it. What's changed this year and what feels different, and I think that this trend will continue, is that that is going away. 
Uh, and with things like NFTs, uh, NFTs are obviously going to start expanding beyond just art and collectibles. Gaming is getting quite big. Um, you guys have had some awesome investments in like, I guess I'd call it like physical use cases of crypto, like Helium convincing people in the real world to do stuff like this. Uh, Hive Mapper as well is really cool. Um, I, I want to start talking about like, there's this big societal shift towards like token governed communities and like almost a reorganization of society, it feels like, and DAOs and NFTs and gaming. Can we take it there? Um, and I guess to Char, I'd pick on you. Um, like you talked a lot about just social tokens um, and how it's um, uh, at the Multicoin Summit and how it's going to, you think it's one of the biggest things that's coming over the next couple of years. So maybe if you could, you could kick us off with that thesis. I think social tokens could be the next big business model for social media in the Web3 world, where you need to find some way to monetize without advertising, right? I, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, of momentum behind like advertising has ruined the web user experience. What else can we do? Um, and this is one potential thing. And if it turns out to replace advertising as a primary business model for social media, like this is a trillion dollar asset class right there. So we're very excited about the potential for social tokens. It is still extraordinarily early in that life cycle. Uh, so it's very hard to say who's going to win. Overall, I like social tokens that are more composable and built on platforms rather than like their own chains necessarily. I think there's going to be cool stuff of like, you know, being able to set up other contracts with those social tokens, you know, whether that's borrow or lend against them or, uh, you know, split it up amongst many people, lots of creative, cool stuff. Um, but I think we are very early and I think it could be the business model that uh, drives Web3 social media. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like all of these things for the first time ever are really actually starting to come together in ways that are fascinating. Yeah. I have two thoughts for that. Um, one is a meta thesis on why all of this is happening. I think it's because attention is the only scarce resource really uh, in a post-scarcity society. And as we continue to move towards being a post-scarcity society and economic efficiency continues to increase, you need to have more automation uh, in the economy generally, you have to find ways to monetize attention. And so communities are that thing. Um, so, you know, that's why I think you're seeing this movement towards DAOs and towards social tokens and all this stuff in the middle of COVID when a lot of people are at home, not working, right? Like it, it, I think this is a major social shift. And as we see more automation in the economy over the next few decades, I think attention becomes more and more valuable because it's the only thing that's scarce. Um, and then the other thing that I would say to, to respond to is just like DeFi so far has been a game. Like you talked about gaming and you talked about DeFi kingdoms and I'm like, you know, actually, I think playing the DeFi game on Ethereum and DeFi Summer last year was more fun than playing Axie this year, uh, right? Like both, you did them to make money. Like no one was playing either of them because like they were fun. But like the puzzle of like, what is it? What is a YABE CRV token? And like, what should I do with it next in order to you know, <laughs> enhance my yield even further? It was like a more fun game, honestly. So like it all is kind of a game right now. The question is like, do you portray it as a game with DeFi on the back end, or do you portray it as DeFi with the game in the back? Yeah, right. <laughs> now, like, which order do you portray it as? Too sure. You've been. You, you tell me that I've been playing game for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a professional investor. <laughs> hey, I'm right there with you. We talk about play to earn. Um, obviously, there are challenges associated with that, where most of the games in Web two rely on on spenders, right? I mean, like ninety eight percent or ninety nine percent of revenue these games rely on a very small percentage of users that come in and spend a bunch of money. Um, do you think that gets ever solved? Like, um, one, are you bullish on this category of play to earn? Um, or do you think that we're just seeing the very early kind of very basic instantiations of games? And, 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 and where do you think this kind of movement really goes? Um, can you, you see some like Mark Pinkas start, start get interested in, in web three, how, how real is it? Cause there, there are obviously folks out there that are critical of it. Kyle, I think I've heard you say, you know, no, as soon as you embed this work element to a game, it stops being fun over time. I think kind of going forward from here, actually the kind of right mental model is just like Roblox and like metaverse things. You're just really creating environments where people want to spend time because they're bored. Um, some people want to build things in Minecraft. Some people want to have a thing that looks like the Sims. Some people want to shoot their friends in Fortnite, whatever. Um, and you're going to have more and more environments where 
there is resources to be gotten and those resources will require time to produce time and, and clicks on the screen. Uh, and there will be markets that will emerge among people, <laughs> right? Like valuing their time. And that will happen in very, very large scale. I, I could definitely see a world in 20 years in which there's like 500 million people who like that is their primary source of income. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say something else on play to earn just real quick. It's play to earn to me is not a category. It's a tactic similar to liquidity mining. You wouldn't call liquidity mining a category of things. It is a user acquisition strategy and it's a bridge to get somewhere to an economic e equilibrium that is sustainable. Um, and so just like, I mean, I wrote a post last year exploring the design space of liquidity mining for DeFi protocols. And the key takeaway was like, if you pay people more than it costs, for them to like do an action, they will do it until that reaches equilibrium and you are not paying them more than it costs. And like professionals will show up and they will arb that. So if you're gonna use play to earn, like I would say use that as a tactic to get to some longer term goal and equilibrium, but it's not a category. Do you guys uh, think about NFTs? Do you invest directly in NFTs? Um, or do you just play kind of the infrastructure layer and you know marketplaces and things like OpenSea? Uh, we can own NFTs. We own a handful, very small number. It's, it's not a meaningful percentage of the fund. Do you personally, Kyle? N not in any meaningful sense of the word, no. Um, I Once I buy a screen for display, art display, then I will probably buy some art. But uh, I don't really care about apes versus punks versus m monkey business or whatever. I, I, I just, I don't, that, that's not my cup of tea. Um, but I do like fighting with people on Twitter. That's very fun. It never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know we got like a few minutes left, guys. Um, I do want to, I do want to kind of zoom out a little bit and, and just, you guys have been around in the space for quite a bit of time. I remember when I first discovered you, Kyle, it was, it was uh, through your writing, um, which is, you know, to me, it was, it was very different at the time. Like, you know, very few people kind of sit down and think about theses and, and stick to them. Um, I'm curious, like, just for folks out there, like, what have been, like, your, you know, your learnings over the years uh, in this space, uh, which feels like forever, um, like, your key takeaways, like, you know, and it could be for builders, it could be for new capital allocators, it could be just for anyone that's listening. Like, I am very curious to get to get that knowledge dump, because uh, you've been through a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's different answers. I would say my single biggest learning from an investment perspective was don't trade beta, right? Like trying to time tops and bottoms, uh, I think is fundamentally impossible, really. Like you can run a profitable liquidity provision strategy, right? Like you're a liquidity provider and you're staying net neutral basically and collecting the spread, like that can be very profitable. If you're trying to trade beta and just be like, oh yeah, I think Bitcoin's gonna top here at 6,000 because it's like double the bottom or you know what Like I, I just, I think that is very, very, very hard to do in any sort of discretionary way. Um, and it's easier to stay long and focus on asset selection. That's probably been the single biggest shift that uh, I've had in my thinking as an investor is like, no, if you are long the asset class, be long the asset class, focus on asset selection, trying to time tops and bottoms is just a fool's errand and you're wasting your brain cycles thinking about it. How, how quickly do you change your thesis? Like, are you re or underwriting your thesis? Like for instance, something like EOS or something like Solana or like, you're constantly processing new information, but you know, in crypto, it, it's sort of liquid venture. It allows you to exit a position relatively gracefully, I guess. There's ways to do that. Um, how quickly do you change? Like you've stuck with Solana over the years. Like that was pretty impressive to see that. Um, but you know, h how willing are you to constantly move quickly and decisively when things are not panning out? Well, our general rule of thumb is we review the thesis underlying every asset in our funds once a quarter. If your time horizon is measured in years, it's unnecessary to do it on any higher cadence than that. In fact, you could make an argument you should go to twice a year instead of four times a year, but whatever, that's, that's fine. We do it four times a year. Um, and, you know, as when we do those reviews, the question we're asking is like, is the thesis invalidated, basically? Um, and there are many ways that thesis can be validated that we can discover the market turns out to be not, not existent, right? It can turn out the team didn't execute all kinds of reasons. A thesis may not work. 
What's important to, to d distinguish is the difference between a market thesis not working and an execution of a thesis not working. We buy things with an intention of holding them forever. That doesn't mean we will end up holding everything forever. That is obviously not going to be the case. But we enter with an intent to hold forever. Um, if you look at basically the last 30 years or so of society, the only thing that really mattered to doing was going long technology. And there's been different sectors of it and, and whatever software and the internet and, and clean tech and such. But if you're right about a thesis, it typically ends up that that thing just kind of compounds at like a pretty healthy rate for minimum 10 years and oftentimes 20 or 30. Um, and so like just let it things compound. Um, it is obviously the most tax efficient way um, to, to grow wealth and, and people definitely underappreciate that. Um, and just let, let things grow. Um, I really do my best to not look at prices and you know, the more you look at prices, the more you get tempted to sell. If you just don't look at the prices, you don't think about selling very frequently. <laughs> uh, and uh, just just let things compound. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the price in, in and of itself is an input into answering the question, is my thesis invalidated? In the sense that you're relying on the market and other people to say, do they believe my thesis or not? Um, I think most other, I think it's kind of a deep human psychological need to want to feel like you're part of the club or part of a, cl a club, I should say, and that other people agree with your, your thesis. So being uh, the, the, lone, the lone wolf for too long um, feels quite painful, <laughs> um, kind of, you know, psychologically. Uh, but you just have to be honest and say, is the core thesis invalidated um, or not? And I, I would say price, we internally almost don't use price as an input engine in that question. I won't say it's 0% input, but it's definitely a very small input. Um, other people seem to weight current price substantially more highly on answering that question, is my thesis invalidated or not? And that's probably uh, one of the things I think we do most uniquely. Just to add to that, I, I just want to say, like most of the returns in investing lie on the tails of the return distribution, right? It, it's just like, it's all um, the mega, mega home runs. And really those are the only things that matter. In an industry like crypto, that is basically all venture type investing, Right, like whether it's public markets or not, like these are all very high risk, high return type opportunities out there. Uh, so all the returns are in the tails. And the only way to capture some return that is in the tails is by sitting and letting it compound. Right. Uh, otherwise, you're going to sell too early. And it, it just like every time you sold early and you were right and the price went down versus the one time you were wrong and the thing went up 100x from there. Right, like you just need to weigh those things against each other. Kyle is very right about the, you know, we don't look at price. Like actually my New Year's resolution for this year is every time I look at price that I'm not trading, I have to do, you know, 10 push-ups or 10 squats. And it's just like, you know, get to work on fitness and health while also reducing looking at prices. Man, Jusha, I feel like if we get you on next year, we'd be Mr. Olympia. <laughs> that, then, that means that I've uh, done a bad job of adhering to the resolution. <laughs> I think it actually makes your decision making worse because like oh, yeah, yeah. you can feel it and hopefully the listeners yeah. can, can like think about this like you open up the your uh, portfolio page on CoinGecko and you see it's all red and like you feel shitty that day right like yeah. or you see it's all green and you feel like i'm really smart and mm -hmm. like that makes you less rational of a decision maker and so like price only matters if you're trading or if you're levered and we're not levered I know we have a couple of minutes left or like one or two minutes left here. Rapid fire. Um, you guys do a lot of blue ocean investing instead of red ocean um, investing, like things like Arweave and Helium where you're kind of creating the market. Uh, first question, what will we see next year that like in the blue ocean front that we just have not seen yet in crypto? Kyle, maybe if you want to start. I mean, this is a really tough question of, you know, where is the next blue ocean going to be? I think it's going to be in a category that I call proof of useful work. Um, and so that includes something like Helium, where Helium is kind of a proof of work protocol, you know, not in the same sense as Bitcoin, obviously, but in the sense that like you have to go work to put hotspots around and create valuable coverage and you get paid to do that. I think HiveMapper is another instantiation of the same thesis. HiveMapper, the idea is you get paid in tokens for like contributing to open street maps. Uh, and also you can help contribute to like an open street view by putting a dash cam on your car and passively uploading the footage. So that stays up to date and use computer vision to analyze everything, right? So like, I think proof of useful work 
is the next blue ocean. Um, I guess I'll talk about one other area that I think is under discussed, but it feels like it's picking up steam is, is payments. We've made at least one, maybe two kind of investments on this front. Um, you know, Circle is going to finish their DSPAC next year. We have a traded company. Um, Jack is, you know, no longer distracted by Twitter and is now all in Bitcoin Lightning for Square. Literally, his Twitter profile doesn't even mention Square. It's just Bitcoin Lightning. Uh, you've got Stripe. You know, they put, asked Matt Wang to join the board. And obviously, they've been pretty loud and vocal about doing crypto things. The Stripe team had like four or five people at Solana Breakpoint in Lisbon. Um you can see, right, Visa, PayPal, MasterCard, they're all starting to do, th right? Like, it's unclear exactly what's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but at some point, all this work happening behind the scenes is going to start to become very, very visible. Um, and I don't know when, but I think that's going to be a really big deal. And uh, I, I think the crypto community, you know, people have been talking about payments since like 2012, 2013, and it's been so long and it, and it hasn't become a thing uh, that people in the community have kind of given up on it, basically, and just you know moved on to other pastures. Uh, but I think there will be a, a reemergence of, of payments in a major way. The other obviously really good thing we have is we have now lots of cheap, fast chains, and we have lots of stable coins. And so we, I think, we, and we have enough fiat on ramps as well. Uh, and I think now we we have the infrastructure where you know the major payments players around the world can can seriously use this stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think in 2022, you'll see at least one large payments company do something of, of real substance on a permissionless chain. Next question here. Biggest bottleneck to the system? Talent. There's just, there's just not enough talent. The fact that valuations are so high is, is, the, math, is the, the market proof of that. Um, there's too much dollars chasing too few people. Yeah, I, I would say to any listeners in the audience who work in traditional finance or at big tech companies... If you are annoyed that the people in crypto and Web3 made way more money than you this year, like quit your job and join the revolution. Stop selling useless, boring financial products or ads and like come build the future. Uh, on that note, let's say we have a couple of different 10x entrepreneurs listening to the show. They're thinking about jumping into the space. What is one thing that you want to see built that is not being built in crypto yet? Um, I would really like to see some sort of decentralized energy grid type thing. Like this is part of the proof of useful work uh, topic that I was talking about earlier. I am not sure what the sustainable answer here is. The best that I have so far is proof of battery capacity or energy storage capacity for clean energy uh, could be like the thing that unlocks the, the decentralization of the electric grid. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring that further with entrepreneurs who are building in that space. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in use cases around uh, making it easier to do payments between people. Uh, I'll give the most kind of lowbrow but high profile example would be either OnlyFans with tokens um, or even just like a dating app like a Hinge or a Tinder or like probably more Tinder than Hinge with straight up pay for my time. Um, I think that would work. There's actually a fair bit of anecdotal data today of people who say like, hey, if you want to DM me uh, on Snapchat or like here's send me 20 bucks on Venmo and then I'll respond to your DMs. So you already kind of have like this ha haphazard way of people trying to do these kinds of behaviors. Um, I suspect OnlyFans with tokens or just Tinder with pay for my time, uh, I, I think will, someone will figure it out. I realize it's like not intellectually very exciting and, and but like it's going to happen and I, I think as it happens, it's going to unlock, a whole, a, it's going to open the rest of the world's eyes to the power of incentives and crypto primitives. And you'll start to see those ideas make their way into other applications. Yeah. Um, I think that design space is, is super interesting. Cool. All right, guys, this has been a, an amazing episode. Appreciate you guys coming on. Want to just check anything else you guys want to add here? No, I think we covered quite a lot. Thanks for having us on and good chatting with you both. Cool. Listeners, I would really recommend three things. One is go to multicoin.capital. Uh, they have a, You can actually subscribe to their newsletter. I'd really recommend that bunch of must read blog posts Two, Kyle's on Twitter at Kyle Samani three Tushar. Tushar, you didn't get a, your name. You got a little underscore after you at Tushar Jane underscore on Twitter. Go follow both these guys, head over to the multi-coin site, go read their stuff. Uh, thanks again, Kyle. Thanks again, Tushar. Really enjoyed this episode. Yeah. Thanks guys. It was great having you on. Thanks guys. Thanks guys.